Okay, uh, so today we're going to be determining the equilibrium constant. of esterification. So, uh, if you have a carboxylic acid, and you treat this one with an alcohol, in the presence of acid, uh, you end up with a, an ester plus water. Now this is an experiment that will determine the equilibrium constant of the carboxylic acid. Notice now the following. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of this because this is part of uh, organic 2 and this is an experiment in organic 1 but you learn how the mechanism takes place in organic two. So what you're gonna be doing is the following. If you balance the equation, you figure out that there is one of this, one of this gives you one of this and one of this. What's the precaution, number one precaution that we have to do is that we have to have dry glassware. Why dry glassware? Because water is a product. And according to Le Chatelier principle that you learned in 152, or chemistry 2, uh, if you have water as a product, this one will uh, reverse the reaction and you will end up with the static materials. And so therefore, we make sure that the uh, glasser are, is absolutely uh, dry. So if in this case, the K equilibrium will be equal to the ester, times water over acid, carboxylic acid, times alcohol. Now that is called a K equilibrium constant. It's a constant. This means the ratio will always be the same. So if you have water in your glassware, what this is going to do is going to increase the ratio and by increasing the ratio, what you're going to be doing then is you're going to have to, in order to bring it back to the value of K equilibrium, you will have to form more of the alcohol and the acid. Okay, so the reaction doesn't take place uh, automatically. The forward reaction is called esterification. The reverse reaction is called hydrolysis. Now, for those people who take biology, okay, triglycerides are actually esters, triesters of an alcohol that has three OH groups and it's called glycerol. And so therefore, the ester, the triester is actually triglyceride, which is fat. So therefore, when you take it in the body, you will have the fat, which fat now um, will undergo reaction in the uh, stomach. Remember now the pH of stomach is very, very close to one. And so therefore the reaction will reverse itself and therefore the ester or the triglyceride will be um, consumed. Now remember now the too much of the triglyceride is not very good because it clogs up the arteries and then you finish up with uh, uh, problems and, uh, with the heart. All right, so what we're going to be doing now is the following. We will use uh, basically a, a one mole or a set one a equal moles of carboxylic acid and an alcohol. The uh, acid we're going to be using is acetic acid. And the alcohol is going to be propanol. And because the OH is in the one position, it's called one propanol. And now you lose water. That's the easy molecule to lose. Remember that. And so therefore, you finish up with an ester. Uh, which is called n-propyl. 
you always use the alkyl group on the group that is attached to the oxygen, and the corresponding acid is acidic, so therefore it's going to be called acidate. Okay, so far so good? Okay. The uh, molecular weight of this compound, the molecular formula C2H4O2, so the molecular weight is 24, plus 4 is 28, and 32 is 60, they have some more. And one propanol, it is C3H8O, so it is 3 times 12 is 36, plus 8 is 44, and 16 is 60, so we finish up with 60 grams more. So the molecular weight of both acetic acid and propanol are the same. So we will take a certain amount of mass, suppose say we need to, uh, I'm sorry, moles, so therefore, suppose say we need to take 0.1 moles of this. This means that we're going to be taking 6.0 grams of this. And 1 point mole of this is 6.0 grams of this. Right? Because remember, moles from general chemistry one is mass of molecular weight. So the mass here will be equal to moles times molecular weight. So it's going to be 0.1 times 6. Okay, so the problem now we have in this case is that both acetic acid and propanol are actually liquids. And so therefore what we need to do is we need to have volumes. So how would you take it? Will you use a, a, a burette, sorry, a pipette, or you can use a burette too if you like. I personally prefer to have two burettes where you can measure the exact volume. The density must be given. Uh, that if you look on page 7-9, of your lab manual, you find out that for acetic acid, the density is 1.05 grams per milliliter. And for uh, n-propyl alcohol, one propanol is 0.80 grams per milliliter. Okay. Now remember now, density is what defined from general chemistry? Density is mass over volume which means the volume here must be the mass over density. So if I need 6.0 grams, this means I have to weigh 6.0 over 1.05, which is roughly about 5.9 milliliters. 5.8, 5.9. In case of propanol here, again, the density is 0.8, which means the volume in this case will have to be um, the mass over the density, and this is 6.0 over 0.8, which is roughly uh, 7.5 uh, milliliters roughly. So you notice now that the volumes are different, and the reason for that is because the densities are different. So what you're supposed to do now is you're supposed to take 5.9 milliliters of this and 7.5 milliliters of that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong with the calculations. But the important thing is that the reaction doesn't take place at room temperature. Uh, what we need to do is we need to heat it up. The problem that we have with heating up is that when you heat up something, it evaporates, so you lose some of the starting material. And so therefore, in this case, we will use something that is called a reflux. <coughs> so in the reflux, what we have is a round bottom flask. We put your liquid in here. And what you do is you hook a, a condenser on top, water in from the bottom, out from the top. Remember now when the water comes out, we always hook it up to a funnel. So this way the water, if the water pressure changes, the water doesn't splash all over. We always have to have boiling chips. So let's try to set it up. Okay, so let's set up the reaction. We have a, a heating mantle here. Uh, notice that we always, again, have to clamp it pretty tight uh, because all the glassware is gonna be on top. And eventually when we wanna stop the reaction, what we do is we have to bring this down. And if we bring this down and it's not well clamped, the whole thing will collapse. Okay, so what we do is we have the round bottom flask.
that is clamped so you get a clamp that is going to be tight so we will bring this round bottom flask make sure the round bottom flask actually touches the heating mantle you must touch the heating mantle otherwise the um, current of air that goes through is not going to heat it up uh, efficiently and the reaction will not take place as it should okay now what we do is we have to use a condenser and when we put it here so we will pour the liquids in here and now what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the condenser again remember now whenever we have a joint um, situation here what we do is we have the uh, round bottom flask we just touch the um, uh, uh, the uh, um, outlet of the condenser and then rotate it and then what in here you have the liquid and the um, uh, boiling chips and now you have the water in from the inside out from the top and we have to have um, a, uh, a funnel tipped uh, or, or hooked at the tip of the hose that is an outlet now when we start heating the liquid is going to start evaporating but remember now this the water jacket outside the inner uh, tube is going to uh, be cooling that inner tube and so the temperature in here will be probably about 18 20 degrees although the boiling point may be more than 100 it will go up and then condense down nothing will escape okay so you, there is no need really to put anything on top some people like to put it but preferably i don't but again it's your instructor who will decide what to do so you will mix these two reagents here for about uh, and we'll start heating for about um, anywhere usually 30 minutes is adequate i uh, ask the students to do it anywhere from 30 minutes to one hour but before we do that we have to find out how much is the acid here remember the um, relative ratio is one and one gives you one on one so if i find out how much acid i have i know how many moles of acid i have which is equivalent to the number of moles of the alcohol and so therefore before we start the fluxing before we start the fluxing we'll take one milliliter using a pipette a pipette now has to be calibrated it's exactly 1.0 milliliter of that pipette okay and then we will perform a titration you've done titrations before you will have the sodium hydroxide here okay and they should be a standardized solution now what you're going to have then is a reaction of a carboxylic acid and a base giving you salt plus water okay. the problem that we have in this case is that the acid and sodium hydroxide and the salt and water are all a clear solution so you don't know really when you have the um, equivalent um, or the end point of the titration because at the equivalence point number of moles of acid equals to number of moles of NaOH okay now because NaOH has only one OH this is equal to molarity equals to normality and so therefore this is the molarity or normality it doesn't really make a difference same thing times the volume and the volume has always been expressed in liters okay now this will be the equivalent moles of the acid the question is how do you reach the equivalent point because when you reach that they are, all solutions are clear so what we do then is we use something that's called an indicator <coughs> 
And the indicator in this case is actually called phenolphthalein, which in acid is clear, absolutely clear. At end point is infinitely pink. Infinitely pink means that it is completely, uh, you can hardly see it. And that's why when we perform titrations, I always suggest that we have a piece of white paper under it. In base, it's pink. Your job is not to make the solution pink. Because whether you add one drop extra or you add 10 liters extra, the color is still going to be the same. And so therefore, what we do then is we perform the titration and we have a conical flask here where we have one milliliter of mixture before reflux. And you have here the phenolphthalein plus the acid, okay? And then you add and the piece of paper, white paper under, right? And you take one milliliter and you take the rest of it and you start refluxing it. When you start refluxing it, um, you'll have enough time to perform a titration and you will find out the exact volume. Knowing now the exact volume in liters, and multiply it by the, dense, by the uh, normality of the base, which is known, you can determine the number of moles you have in that one milliliter of the mixture. Okay, when you finish refluxing, and again, reflux means what? You set up this apparatus. Um, they, in here, in the round bottle flask, you have the acid, the base, the uh, alcohol, and the boiling chips, and you add eight drops of concentrated sulfuric acid, which is the catalyst. When you do this, um, then you perform a, um, you, so you add the sulfuric acid and you start refluxing. And then when you finish up, you cool, after one hour, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever your instructor says, you cool that mixture. And when you cool that mixture, uh, you will take one milliliter again with the same pipette that you have already cleaned up and dried out and you perform another titration. Now remember now, when we did the first titration, okay, we used the amount of acid that was present in one milliliter of that solution. When we finish up with the reflux, some of that acid would have been uh, consumed because you created ester. The ester was not there to begin with. And so therefore, you'll have one titration, which is the initial titration, which is V1. And then after that, you take one more milliliter and you titrate it, which is at the end of reaction. So you have V2. So you have V1 and V2. However, remember now, when before we perform the reaction, we, or the reflux, we added eight drops of sulfuric acid. And so therefore, what we have to do is we have to account for that acid because that acid in the second titration will uh, also be neutralized by the base. So therefore, what we do then instead, we use V2 prime, which is V2 minus 0.5, which is the average amount of acid that we have done over the years uh, that of sulfuric acid is present in uh, the one milliliter at the end of the reflux. Now, the question is, all right, so we got these volumes. Remember now, K equilibrium is mass is moles times moles over moles times moles. It's equimolar, right? But moles equals molarity times volume. And the molarity in all cases is supposed to be the same. And so therefore, what you can do in calculating the KQ which has, by the way, no units because you have square here and square here cancelling out. And so therefore what is going to happen then is you are going to, can, you can use the volumes instead. So K equilibrium will be equal 
to the ester, the amount of ester that you formed, which is going to be V2 prime V1 minus V2 prime all squared over uh, the, um, sorry, yeah, over the amount of acid is left over, which is equal to V2 prime squared. This is going to give you the value of KQ, and by doing that, you can determine the acid. Uh, uh, the um, esterification uh, constant for this. Usually the esterification constant is anywhere from 1 to 4, um, but uh, it's very, very uh, difficult uh, to uh, estimate. You can do all the calculations, but this experiment shows you A, gives you a review of journal chemistry 2, B tells you, again, reminds you how to do a titration, and C, how to use density to calculate uh, ma uh, uh, volumes and knowing what the mass is supposed to do via uh, uh, the required number of moles. Okay?